it will be given by uh, Dr. Hugh Foy, who is the co-chair of the mini medical seminars. Dr. Foy is a professor in surgery. He works at Harborview Medical Center. He is actually director of their surgical specialties clinic. Now, you hear about Harborview Medical Center almost every day in the newspapers, so you can imagine how busy he is. It, he takes care of trauma patients and also the surgical intensive care unit patients. In our medical school a few years ago, they decided to change the curriculum. And Dr. Foy is, was selected to be one of the few instructors that heads up these very small teaching colleges. They wanted to select the best teachers of over 1,500 faculty. He was one that they selected. And he heads one of these colleges. It's called Wind River College. Dr. Foy received his medical degree from the University of Nebraska. And he did his residency training here at the University of Washington. In addition to the general surgical training, he did um, a burn fellowship. You're going to see pictures of his clinical interests. They include trauma, surgical infections, as well as gastrointestinal surgical procedures. He does a lot of teaching of medical students and has actually received the Margaret Anderson Award for his help and support and actually mentorship of the medical students. So welcome, Dr. Foy. What I'm going to show you is a little bit of what I do, and it's a, a reflection of our very unique uh, practice at Harborview. I'm going to go through a little bit of the anatomy and physiology and the setup for these serious infections so you can understand how these bacteria work. And, and their strategies that have evolved so that you can recognize the people at risk, the patients, the early symptoms and sign, and then we'll review the principles of treatment. And I'll go through the history, the nomenclature of these flesh-eating bacteria, which seems to be popular in some of the tabloid press. Um, I love that line from Men in Black, right, where a guy picks up the, the tabloid and the guy goes, what are you reading that stuff for? He says, no, no, I get my best leads here. Uh, so this flesh-eating bacteria is kind of like the, you know, the two-headed monster from Mars. But I'll show you that indeed it's, it's almost as frightening as some of those aliens. And we'll talk about how they present clinically and then how we diagnose them, how we treat them. The history of this, I mean, this is basically what grandpa and great-grandpa called gangrene. And in, in, at the time of the Civil War, at least in the English medical literature, it was called hospital gangrene. And if you saw the movie Dances with Wolves, you remember those horribly graphic uh, depictions of what happens to someone when they were shot, and that the only treatment at that time was really radical amputation. The end of that century, a Frenchman named Fournier described this horrible infection of the genitalia of the scrotum primarily of elderly men. It's a, still a scourge today. And in 1924, one of my great heroes, a guy named Frank Melanie, who had appointments in both bacteriology and surgery at Columbia Hospital in New York, described this synergistic infection between uh, staph and strep that I'll show you some examples. And finally, in 1952, a year before I was born, this guy Wilson described and coined the term necrotizing fasciitis. And there's all of these terms that are used over the years to refer to these horrible infections that require surgical treatment as well as antibiotics. There's a whole myriad of them, and it's confusing, and we ne we're never quite sure even in our setting what to call them. So finally, people said, ah, it's too confusing. And speaking of confusing, I'm nowhere smart enough to make a slide like that, but one of my colleagues, Avery Nathans, did. <laughs> what it comes down to really is a very practical, functional classification. It's clostridia, that thing that causes cl classic gangrene you know, tetanus, botulism, all of those horrible things, and non-clostridial infections. And in the non-clostridial infections, it's pure strep. And this just isn't garden variety strep, but this is a monster akin to the MRSA you heard about last hour. This is a specific strain of strep that has evolved to be exceedingly toxic. And so also there's uh, 
a strep and friends that I like to think, or the mixed necrotizing soft tissue infections, which are really, you know, the typical horribly uh, infected bed sores and other uh, in surgical wound infections, which, believe it or not, uh, like Melanie's and, Staff, uh, and Fournier's, are a little bit easier and more straightforward to treat. Well, there's been a real rising incidence. One, as we've seen, is this selection pressure of antibiotics. And we'll talk a little bit about population biology. The rising incidence of diabetes in our country. It's just an absolute epidemic, as well as obesity. And in this slide, you can see the incidence and the vast rise in the number of people who are grossly overweight in our society. And you'll, I'll show you examples why that's important. The other thing is, is an epidemic of injection drug use and narcotic addiction. There are 20,000 addicted people in King County alone. It's a silent epidemic. But I'll tell you what, as one addict told one of my residents, the guy said, gee, how do you get $150 a day to support your habit? And he looked, at him, looked him in the eye and says, I'll tell you what, pal, nothing legal. So the burglary the petty theft, the missing car stereo, the prostitution, the dealing is a synergistic subculture that ex exists. And all you have to do is kind of make the trip from Pike Street Market up to the freeway and you get an idea of where some of the epicenters of that activity lie. So I take care of a lot of addicted people too. Uh, and so I, we'll talk a bit about that as well. This is a slide that documents the incredible rise in incidence of injection drug use uh, or intravenous drug use. I like to say injection because many of the patients I take care of have long run out of veins. So that, and the, one of the changing patterns is they do what they call on the street muslin or muslin, if I can use more proper and not resort to my Midwest diction. Uh, they inject not into the vein because they're all gone and all used up, but into the muscle, which gives a better delivery, and many times they miss and they're in the subcutaneous fat, which has a poor blood supply. Luckily, this epidemic of injection drug use had peaked out in our country a while ago, but it's still a major problem. Well, let's consider where these things start. A little bit about the anatomy, the types of wounds, the host defenses, and the strategies of the bacteria. Well, the skin's blood supply comes from the underlying muscle tissue. And it sends blood vessels out of the muscle through that, what you call at the dinner table, pardon the expression, gristle. That's what we call in the operating room fascia. It's the dense connective tissue that surrounds muscle. It comes through that fascia, and then right underneath the skin, after it's gone through the subcutaneous fat, as you can see in this diagram here, um, as it goes through the fat, that trunk of the tree has very, very few branches. So there's not much blood supply in the subcutaneous fat. It's only when it reaches that subdermal plexus here that it begins to arborize or branch out, much like this beautiful oak tree overlooking Elliott Bay on Queen Anne Hill. Closer up, you can see the very rich blood supply in the skin. So when you cut yourself, right, the most superficial of cuts, a paper cut, hurt the worst. Because you're up there, it bleeds a lot, and most of the time you never get through the dermis or this white thing. You are all the time in these layers here that are very, very rich in blood supply. Full thickness injuries evolve down into the fat. So these Myofascial perforators, as we call them in doctor talk, come out of the muscle and branch out beneath the skin, leaving very little, if any, blood supply behind in the fat. Now, th there's a lot of different kinds of wound, and this is one of the wounds worst I've ever seen. This is a guy run over by a boat, which happens a lot in the summer months here. This is a laceration. We also see puncture wounds, avulsions, or tearing of the skin and soft tissue, or abrasions. It's about the worst puncture wound I've ever seen. A guy th went through a fence at high speed, and this is a piece of a rod that went through his leg. But a puncture wound is the reason our mothers went 
crazy when we stepped on the rusty nail. And what did they do? Where did we go? We went and got a tetanus booster, right? Because at least my mother, bless her heart, as she rests in peace, and their generation saw people die of tetanus in this country. And if any, how many of you have ever worked overseas in a less developed country? Any of you? I'd the best three months I've ever spent in my life was uh, my, uh, three months working in the Republic of Haiti. I, if, if I was the czar of medical education for the United States, I'd make sure every medical student and almost every professional did the same. Two months in a less developed country. There, people still die of tetanus as they do throughout the whole world. Well, the problem in that fat is there's no blood supply, there's no oxygen, and organisms like Clostridia thrive in that oxygen-poor environment, as do some of the streps. Avulsions, or what we call degloving injuries, and my grandmother called that a ringer injury when they used to have the old ringer washers, it just pulls the skin and the subcutaneous tissue off of the underlying muscles. So these are injuries that involve kind of torque. And this was a fellow who slipped underneath a bus, and that big bus tire just caught the skin of his leg and just sheared it off of the underlying muscle. And that plane above, between the muscle and the skin is where many of these organisms thrive, particularly if there's not enough skin. And that's what happens when the skin peels off. Well, the problem with obesity in my practice is that you're only born with a certain number of fat cells. And those fat cells just get bigger and bigger and bigger as you live and eat with every, you know, bon bon, ding dong, ho ho, whatever you put in your mouth. <laughs> you just, those fat cells get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can see these fat lobules in this picture in the operating room. This is someone's abdominal wall, OK? This, and you can see in proportion to my hand, how big these lobules of fat are. There's hardly any blood supply to them. And that's your primary defense against bacteria, is blood supply. Well, a host defense, just to back up and give you a little background, first and foremost relies on an adequate blood supply. And your immune response co is composed of all those cardinal signs of inflammation in Latin, Two more, rubor, dolor, and calor, right? The swelling, the redness, the pain, and the heat of a wound. And you've all seen examples of infections. All of those are not just infections, but inflammation. And within inflammation, we're taught in medical school in that first year pathology class that there's two basic types. There's humoral or cellular uh, inflammation, which is white blood cells that attack things that make antibodies, et cetera. And then there's granulomatous inflammation. When you can't attach and attack and kill the bacteria, your next hope is to wall it off and contain it in a shroud of fibrous tissue. And we'll see why that's really important. And here we see a white cell in this cartoon that is stuck to the inner lining of a microscopic blood vessel, a capillary, and it's starting to leak out into the tissue to go attack an offending bacterium. Well, again, the bad news is the fat has a very bad blood supply. But the good news is one of the fundamental processes of wound healing, this redness, this rubor, is to grow new microscopic blood vessels on top of that fat. So it goes from, in the first picture, that those big lobules of yellow to, in the bottom picture, it carpets that fat with these microscopic blood vessels that uh, are capillaries when you see them on a microscopic view. So this carpet of blood vessels or granulation tissue sets up a barrier against further invasion. The problem is it takes four to five days for that neovascularization to occur. And that's where the bacteria can get the jump on us. And in a 
typical growth curve of bacteria or any biologic process, there's a lag phase and then an accelerant phase. And it's in that lag, lag phase that if you have enough of an inoculum, enough of a critical mass of bacteria in a place where you have poor blood supply, they're going to beat you. Okay? It's like that one old rock and roll song. You know, the guy says, he gets caught with the wrong woman in the wrong place. He says, just give me two steps, mister. Just give me two steps to the door. Give me two steps, mister, and I'm not going to bother you no more. Well, if you don't, the bacteria get those two steps, and there they proliferate so fast. And in fact, Clostridia, in its optimal environment, can double itself in eight minutes. You can literally watch the wound redness or erythema, as we say, spread before your very eyes. So it's really a race against the clock. So when we have a perforated colon or a perforated appendix or something like that, most of the time we won't close the skin layer. We'll leave the subcutaneous fat open so that it's exposed to the air and give it four or five days for this neovascularization to occur. Surgical infections are those that require some type of sharp debridement, drainage, uh, and they're typically abscesses, necrotizing fasciitis, or what we like to refer to now as necrotizing soft tissue infection, or NSTIs, clostridial infections, and it, there's a whole host of infections that clostridial will cause, but myonecrosis. Anytime there's necrotic debris, it needs to be cleaned out. Well, let's back up a half step. I once learned some population biology from a guy named Paul Ehrlich who wrote a book called The Population Bomb back in the late 60s. And he taught me there's two different fundamental strategies for reproduction. And one is K-dependent organisms like humpbacks and we other primates. So we have few offspring, a very long pregnancy or gestation period, and we, we nurture our young a long time. You know, 20, 30, 40 years, who knows, <laughs> you know? Our dependent organisms are like bacteria or bugs. We kind of use ba bacteria and bugs as synonymous in our business. They make thousands at a time. And if you've ever been out when the sun has come out on a summer day after a rain, you know what a bug hatch really means. All of a sudden, you're coated with thousands of, of, back, or of, uh, of insects. So fish, bugs, bacteria, they make, they make a lot. And so they're counting on, well, you know, they're not all going to live, uh, you know, so we can't nurture them. But as depicted in, in this famous movie, uh, bacteria have needs too. I mean, they've got to get around. Uh, they need shelter. They need protection. They need food. They need to feed, feed their young. And they also have to compete and find unique habitats so that they can get a leg up and avoid the competition of their other bacteria that uh, may compete with them. But see, they've got a limited repertoire and a limited amount of time to nurture their young. They can't send them to an Ivy League college, buy them an oil co company, all those other things. So they've got to move fast. <laughs> they've got to get around. They don't make concrete, they don't make asphalt, but they make slime. So whenever we see a slimy, wet wound, we know there's probably bacteria in there. And so keeping those wounds clean and dry is really important. They can protect themselves. And this is a unique, wonderful, brilliant strategy. These are called encapsulated organisms. H. flu, Haemophilus influenza, or meningococcus, or pneumococcus. They make a special coating protein that serves several purposes. One, it's a disguise. Okay, the, the, your antibodies can't even recognize that, you're, that they're there. Uh, and you need a special coating protein to stick to the capsule so the antibodies can then stick to it. And if you're lacking a spleen from trauma, like happens in my business, or you were born without a spleen that makes this special coating protein, you're at risk for these horrible infections that sometimes once we, the physicians, realize you have them, and we give you antibiotics and we lyse the cell wall, you release this inflammatory process in your body that's so bad that you die. Sepsis or SIRS, where your shock from the infection is so bad, we can't give you IV fluids fast enough. 
So encapsulation is a very brilliant strategy of these bacteria. Some bacteria decide, well, everybody else is using oxygen. I'll not use oxygen. So anaerobes who thrive in the absence of oxygen, like Clostridia and these so-called microaerophilic strep, love dead tissue. I mean, that's their job on the planet is to return us back to nitrogenous fertilizer, right? <laughs> so we teach our residents and students in surgery. And I walked in. I thought I had a busy day today. My partner was on last night. I walked in at 7 o'clock this morning. I stopped by the OR board. There were four infections that needed to breed it that were left over from last night alone. And I said, oh, I better change my attitude. I don't know busy yet. So these things, they love dead tissue. You've got to debreed them. And you know that's a pretty good strategy, but uh, only if you're already dead and in the casket and you want to be returned to fertilizer. The other thing that some of these bacteria do is they make simple proteins that are extremely effective. Some, and the strep and the clostridia, dissolve protein. And they look for the easiest protein to dissolve, which is in that, a layer of connective tissue in your fat layer, the superficial subcutaneous fascia, which is really the I5 of necrotizing soft tissue infections. They can alter your coagulation. They can either start coagulation or they can stop it. Staph likes to stop it. It has a protein called coagulase. It isolates thing to an abscess, to a boil, to a furuncle. Okay? Strep dissolves it so it spreads diffusely. And it can also dissolve clots. Streptokinase is actually a pharmacologic agent that we use occasionally to melt away clots in an uh, occluded or clogged artery. Here's an example of a strep infection. And this is in a diabetic foot. And uh, every Tuesday morning, my orthopedic colleague and a whole multidisciplinary group, we go around and see people with wounds or who have, are at risk for amputation. We call it limb viability rounds. We saw this lady who was diabetic. And she started with just some little, what looked tiny little bruises. Uh, and gradually, they coalesced into a larger bruise that was confluent. And finally, it became soft or fluctuant. And we stuck a needle in it. And sure enough, there was some pus, some purulent drainage in there. Okay, So one of the tips of an early severe streptococcal infection may be these little speckled bruises that we call petechiae. Now, surgical infections are the ones that need drainage or debridement. And I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about these at the bottom of the list uh, that are uh, ones that are the most severe, some of them more so than others, and clostridial myonecrosis being the very worst. Again, remember, it's clostridia and non-clostridia. And in the non-clostridia, it's pure strep, group A beta hemolytic strep, to be technically precise, and strep and friends, or a strep-like organism that works in concert with other bacteria, such as in the Fourniers or Melanies. Okay? Now, strep and staph are gram-positive cocci. Okay? They stain dark with the gram stain, and they're little round balls. Okay? They both live on our skin everywhere, and they usually cause mild, non-lethal infections. There's what strep looks like. Rather than grape clusters, it likes to organize itself in chains. Okay? And it could cause cellulitis, like this arm in the bottom picture, which is just diffuse redness, and it always blanches or turns white when you put pressure on it. It's tender. Or lymphangitis, or what, again, grandma called blood poisoning, when the strep will get into the lymphatics that drain the tissue fluid back to your heart. The worst, though, are these group A strep that are hemolytic, or what is known as group A strep, or GAS, that you'll see in the literature. They do much more. They dissolve tissue, and they spread like a brush fire, and they make a lot of toxins and poisons. Now, here's a classic staph abscess. Okay, This is in a very creative addict who uh, ran out of veins in his arm, so he thought he'd use his jugular vein. And he has an abscess. And when we incised and opened that abscess, out of it comes, as we say in a business, creamy, off-white, non foul-smelling pus. 
Okay? So I, we teach the residents and students the first way you make a bacteriologic diagnosis is with your nose. Before you even look at the wound, sometimes before you even walk in the OR, sometimes two flights away. <laughs> this is a great one. This is when two bacteria work together. And this is kind of gram positive peer pressure because the staff says, let's stay right here. I got coagulase. Let's just stay here and make an abscess. The strep says, no, no, no. It's kind of like your worst nightmare buddy in high school. No, no, we had some beer. Let's go. No, 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 let's stay right here. And the strep says, no, 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 let's spread. And they said, no, let's stay. So they kind of check and balance and both facilitate but limit each other. And so this is the leg on the medicine service, which despite appropriate antibiotic therapy, on the third day still looking red, still looks a little shiny. And we go down there and we see this full thickness punched out ulcer. And we go, oh, well, let me see a Q-tip. That's an 8-inch Q-tip buried to the hilt, OK? And if you open it, it's a lake of this creamy, non-foul-smelling purulence that lives above the fascia, the investing fibrous layer of your tibialis anterior muscle, that big one in the front where you get shin splints, OK? And that's what Frank Melanie described way back in the 20s. Now, you see the strep makes these enzymes to spread. Now, the group A strep is a more virulent strain. And it was described in the first clinical outbreak, actually, at Children's back in the late 80s, when some, these young kids who got chicken pox got super infected with this horrible strep that spread all over their body. It's the same trick. Through this process of producing billions and billions and billions of offspring, the chance that you're going to have a mutation, particularly if the bacteria has been infected with a virus that inserts DNA into your gene, you make a different protein. And that protein may give you such a phenomenal advantage evolutionarily that you take off like a rocket ship, OK? Now, these infections, whether they're strep or they're clostridia, typically present with severe pain. Because a lot of the time, they involve a certain amount of loss of blood supply. And so ischemia, or the lack of blood supply, causes severe pain in the tissues. And it's oftentimes out of proportion to what we see on the surface. Later, we'll see some ecchymosis is a, a word that means bruising. Paul d'Orange, obviously French, for an orange peel appearance of the swollen skin and hemorrhagic blisters. And pure streptococcal gangrene is less uh, common, but it could and it can and does seed hematogenously. This is an example. This is a good God-fearing church musician in her 80s who came in with this, not a lot of redness, but this strange blister, this hemorrhagic blister, we weren't quite sure, but we took her to the operating room, and you could just take your finger and easily lift that skin and subcutaneous tissue off of the muscles and tendons of her entire forearm. Okay? And she, it was spread through the blood stream from a strep throat in an area that she had trivial trauma and a bruise. But once the strep was circulating around, it found dinner. And it landed there, and it just so happened to be one of these virulent strains. Now, this is the abdominal wall of a morbidly obese person that weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds, who came in, had a little breakdown in a skin crease. And by the time he got to us, he had all of the classic features of a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Again, you can see the size of those fat lobules. You can see these dark lines, or the clotted blood vessels, the thrombosis, this porter orange, this edema swelling of the skin, and these target lesions. Okay, These are infarcted or dead skin because the strep has gone there and gone. Remember the tree and the trunks? It's gone through there in that layer and clipped all the trunks off. And so when the trunks are clipped off, the blood vessels are occluded by the infection of the subcutaneous tissue, the skin loses its blood supply, and we see these areas of infarction or necrosis, dead skin. Well, it's usually a, a clinical diagnosis of all of these things, sometimes a fever, not always, but a, occasionally a high blood count. 
I had to call up and get on the phone this morning and call down to the operating room and I said, I'm sorry, but our second abscess we have to drain, I have to bump an elective case. I have to tell somebody who's waited months, perhaps, for their operation to happen today, Tuesday morning, that they have to wait because this person has a very high white count and a very high likelihood of having one of these life-threatening infections. So we have to go to the front of the line to get in the operating room. Otherwise, I don't know when we would do them. Tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and by that time they may well be dead. So our protocol is when the white blood count is above 17,000, they go to the front of the line because to wait may be lethal. So the other features, sometimes lab tests, and there's elaborate schemes that people have devised to help people figure out when you have one, when you don't, in terms of the white count, the kidney function, the creatinine, uh, a whole host of different lab indicators. X-rays are helpful sometimes. The problem is, you know, gas gangrene. Not all clostridia makes gas, and not all that makes gas is clostridia, so you don't know, but when you do see gas, it surely raises your interest and suspicion. Sometimes, in order to make the diagnosis, we actually have to take the patient to the operating room, make an incision, and see if the tissues have become loose, okay? Sometimes CAT scans, CT scans are helpful, and you saw an example of the one in the necrotizing lung, to see where that gas may extend or where the infection is, because sometimes they can be quite subtle as they dissect and follow these tissue planes that you'll appreciate when you go to the gross lab. MRI is very popular, but it's also very expensive, and it turns out for a lot of conditions, it's not much helpful than tests were that we had developed like bone scans 30 or 40 years ago. And most importantly, you can't delay the operative debridement. Now, this is what people refer to as a finger test, making an incision, and you can see again the thickness of the, the fat tissue in the wall, but remember that musician she had about four millimeters of subcutaneous fat, and she got one too. But this has all the classic features, the pot orange, right, the, the orange peel swelling of the skin, the targeted lesions of the necrotic skin. But I could take my finger and just run it up and down, and the enzymes the bacteria made had completely dissolved that connective tissue. And we know we're done to breeding when we can't dissect any further with our fingers. Okay, so there's some surgery you still have to do with your hands and you can't do with the laparoscope. And debriding necrotizing soft tissue infections are one of them. Well, the mixed necrotizing soft tissue infections, like Fournier's gangrene of the perineum, these typically, they smell foul. There's necrotic tissue and that's the anaerobes. One of the key features is that it, the putrefication of the flesh creates a horribly acrid odor. This is a picture of an elderly gentleman, a typically diabetic in their 70s, sometimes younger. This is a scrotum is so swollen that his penis has retracted. It's not retracted, but the swelling has engulfed it, and you can see the Foley catheter coming out of it. And I can tell you that this horrible looking picture is the tip of a huge iceberg that extended all the way up onto his anterior abdominal wall. And so these, these infections, once they get to the point where they, you know, the scrotum's very expansile and it's got these loose connective tissues around it. It's a horrible problem. Luckily, a mixed infection, you debreed it, put them on proper antibiotics, they actually do quite well. Clostridia is a different animal. See, what we're talking about is these new evolved streps with the potent toxins on one hand that is kind of a new phenomenon and clostridia that's been around forever. Been around forever, been around everywhere. It's everywhere in the soil, okay? It lives in the soil, and again, it's an anaerobe. It, it avoids oxygen. It produces extremely potent toxins. This is like cobra venom. And the, the limb of a patient with a clostridial infection actually looks like somebody bitten by a venomous snake, like a rattlesnake or a cobra. It has a broad, broad spectrum of disease, you hear about clostridia difficile diarrhea, which is a problem where if you kill all the, all the microbes except a few that are resistant, they overgrow, and it'll overgrow in your colon, and it can give you a real severe infection there too, but usually it is self-limiting. But clostridia perfringens, 
and if some of its other relatives cause fatal infections that if they're not promptly recognized, they can take your life. And they can do it within hours. Some of the most frightening things I've ever witnessed as a clinician. This isn't cocci. These are, these are big, plump, what we call rods. We call them boxcars. And sometimes they have these little tennis racket shaped spores down here. Here's a white cell, a polymorphonuclear cell. It's got these lobes of its nucleus next to typical gram-positive rods of clostridia that form these tennis racket spores and also next to some strep and a mixed infection. So it has a very characteristic appearance on gram stain, but the thing you don't see are a lot of white cells. This isn't actually a lot of white cells. Again, a whole host and uh, different uh, types of clinical infections from botulism uh, that you get from uh, poorly prepared canned meat, typically. But C septicum, some of these things like to live in ulcerated colon cancers, a whole spectrum of disease. But mostly, it's the tetanus, the perfringens, and the novii clostridia. One of the key features early in clostridial infection is just excruciating pain, all right? It attacks the nerves, too. Hence, tetanus, it gives you a muscle spasm, also does, does a, a similar thing to your sensory nerves. The skin color can be very faint and almost imperceptible, very faint, not the bright red of, of, of streptococcus. It's not thick pus, and that's why the gross appearance is really important, but it's described as thin dishwater, kind of musty, foul-smelling drainage. And the reason that it's thin and not thick is there's no white cells in it. What makes staphylococcal pus thick are dead white cells. Clostridia has this brilliant trick that it blocks the signal known as chemotaxis, that your, these little inflammatory chemicals tell your white cells, hey, hey, over here, here's the trouble. Come on over here. It's like a flare to the white cells. Come here, here's the problem. It blocks the flare. So the white cells don't come to the infection. Brilliant strategies. That's why we see a leaping white count in clostridia, because they come out of their hiding places and their homes in the spleen and the liver and stuck to the walls of the blood vessel and come out into the bloodstream, but they don't know where to go because clostridia blocks the signal. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant strategy. Okay? We see changes in serum sodium, hyponatremia we call it. We don't know why. And then again, this leaping white count. That's why they get to go to the front of the line, because we're worried if it's 17 now, it's going to be 25 in an hour, it's going to be 30 in two hours, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it lives in this uh, low oxygen environment, makes uh, different gases, and it makes these potent mediators and blockers of the inflammatory process. This is a above knee amputation, so the femur bone has been cut off uh, in this patient. And uh, right there, this was actually the lady I saw in the Republic of Haiti. I went by, made my morning rounds, and I walked by this lady in the hall. It'd just be full of people that they'd admit at night. And I, I'd said, so what's this lady's problem? They go, oh, she's diabetic. She's got an infected leg. And I went over, and I, I looked at her leg, and I squeezed her leg. And it was like Rice Krispies because it was full of gas. This black area that you see on the slide is all subcutaneous gas. It's erythema from the gas gangrene. Well, these toxins do a whole host of things. Uh, these exotoxins, they'll kill your red cells, they'll kill your white cells, they inhibit the chemotaxis, the flare that says, hey, guys, over here, help us. They'll degrade the lining of your nerves, the sphing sphingomyelin. That's why it causes tetanus and severe muscle spasm and a whole host of different things. But these things are like cobra venom. They are phenomenal. This is a 32-year-old guy who was admitted to our service on a Sunday. My, one of my associates was on. And I was in the operating room on a Monday morning doing an elective scheduled inguinal hernia, pretty mundane case. The intern kept getting paged from the nurse on the ward. He'd say, well, give him another liter of fluid. And I didn't pay much attention the first time. And after the second call, and give him another liter of IV fluid. I said, what's wrong with that guy? Oh. He wrecked his ATV, and the handlebar went through his thigh. And we think he has a blood clot in his 
thigh. And I said, after one day, he's got a blood clot? Yeah, it's really swollen. And I said, and why were you giving him fluid? He said, well, his blood pressure is a little low, 80, which is, as we learned last week, very low. I said, let's go up and look at him. We looked at, we went upstairs, we opened the wound, and there was this pale erythema, the bruising, and this thin, watery drainage. And it turns out he had driven a piece of dirty Levi's through his anterior skin, and it rested against the posterior skin of his leg. And I went out and I told his wife, I said, I'm really sorry, but this looks like gas gangrene, and I'm, uh, we're hopeful we'll be able to save his life. I don't think we'll save his leg. But in fact, one of our fellows took him back after we debrided him once, debrided him again and debrided that evening and found the piece of Levi, the jeans, his pants that was so dirty, and got it out of there, and the guy actually ended up doing very well. But he really needed prompt recognition by someone who knew those subtle hints. And if, you know, I may not be good for anything, but you know, like Woody Allen says, 80% of life's showing up. <laughs> to recognize early prompt surgical treatment and the appropriate IV fluids and antibiotics and then reconstruction. And when I show you the results of what we do, the reconstruction is really the, the most important part. And, and we have all these great reconstructive surgeons on our burn unit. We built a burn unit in 1980 to hold 18 ICU patients. Yesterday there wasn't a single one, not a single burn patient up there. But it's full of people with these types of problems. The antibiotics I won't belabor, but these antibiotics are old school antibiotics, so cheap they barely pay to make them penicillin, clindamycin, that shuts down the toxin production in the nucleus, and genomycin. And, but the debridement after the IV resuscitation, the IV antibiotic, has got to be prompt. It's got to be extremely aggressive. And I know in my early career, I, mi I did not debride infections aggressively enough. Um, and it was just due to my inexperience. And it's got to be repeated daily until clean. So when we walk out of the operating room in one of these grisly cases, next thing we do, we go to the desk and we say, put them on the schedule for tomorrow. Put them on the add-on list. And we tell the people on call that night, check their white count. If it goes back up, take them back to the OR sooner rather than later. Or as the old term in Shakespeare and Macbeth said, you have to be bloody, bold, and resolute. And see, that's why surgery is a fairly good path for a medically inclined person who might have some sociopathic principles. <laughs> you know, some character traits. Um, because, and, and, and I teach on my residents, I said, your mantra must be, let them live to sue me for taking their leg off. Can you imagine what a horrible job that is? Let them live to sue me. You know, because sometimes you have to do that in order to save their lives. Now, there's a whole lot of other things. Hyperbaric oxygen, you hear a lot about that, mostly because they're trying to stay in business. Uh, these people are so sick, you can't put them in a chamber. Activated protein C, or, you know, which is a recombinant drug to treat sepsis. The problem is it causes coagulopathy. It makes you bleed, so it's not very helpful in that. IVIG, or intravenous immunoglobulin, is helpful. But we, in desperation, started to use plasmapheresis, where you plug them into a thing like a dialysis machine, wash their blood out, take out all the evil humors and toxins, and then put blood and plasma back in them. Because we saw people even later that were dying. And we weren't sure, did we just not debride them well enough, or were there some delayed washout of these potent, horrible toxins? So there's a lot of things you can do. Well, here's what the wound looks like after you've debrided a thigh, and it's got that nice granulation tissue, and it's ready for a skin graft. And the unsung heroes of this whole thing are our plastic surgeons, who are so used to taking care of these huge, horrible burns, they don't flinch an instant at a wound like that. And when we went back and we looked at the people we took care of, we saw that you know, there were, they were uh, a lot of them were injured. We didn't know what happened or idi idiopathic. A lot of them were injection drug use. And we have a huge problem with inje injection drug use in Seattle and much of our country. And the problem is it's an impure product that's like gummy tar. It lacks the last several steps of purification. And when it's melted down and injected and injected into the sub-Q fat, 
The only thing your body can do with it is to surround it in fibrous tissue, and these people end up with a fibrous exoskeleton like a crustacean. They can no, their tissues can no longer, longer expand. They're usually mixed infections or polymicrobial in most cases, and a high incidence of anaerobes. Turns out there's some very entrepreneurial individuals in the distribution chain that when they cut or step down the heroin product because it's brown, can you know, increase their profit margin by throwing a handful of dirt in it. And that dirt contains clostridia. So most, physi most physicians will never see clostridial sepsis in their entire career. We see it once every three weeks down there. Okay? And it is the most frightening thing I've ever seen. Appreciated in an outbreak in Scotland with clostridia novii back in 2000 from a simpler thing. And they saw this horrible shock and hypotension and these huge white counts and a very high mortality. And this is what it looks like if you inject this black tar heroin into your arm for decades and you get a contracture of the subcutaneous tissue. Or this is, believe it or not, a thigh that is just rock hard with fibrous tissue. And these black areas aren't dead tissue, it's black tar deposits. Last week, we took 9% of the body surface area off the lateral thighs of a young woman who was in rehab, but she kept getting these chronic recurrent infections. We have a saying on our service, you know what black tar and radiation therapy, herpes and diamonds have in common? It's your gift forever. It's the gift that keeps on giving because people will bump themselves, break open one of those fibrous encapsulations, and re inoculate their tissue. Or if it gets in your subclavian vein, this is uh, the chest of a man that was debrided who got it in the subclavian chain underneath his air. So we went back, we looked, a lot of drug users, a lot of diabetics. And uh, Daniel and I and Eileen Bolger were the primary authors of our review, which is actually one of the largest reviews of necrotizing soft tissue infections in the country. Most of them are in the lower extremity because they don't drain well and scattered around the rest of the uh, body. The mortality, rather than 45%, like the Scottish series, which was all clostridia, was 17%. The odds ratio of death, where if you're old, your kidneys are failing, your white count's more than 40,000, remember 10,000 is normal or lower, or if um, you were an injection drug user. And when we saw clostridia infection and a white count of 40,000, the mortality was 50%. As you can see in this graph, that inflection point, once you get to 40, and it, the mortality rate is uh, exceedingly, exceedingly high. So amputations, you need a lot of people. You need specially trained nurses. Uh, the, this in review are the things you see, diabetics, obese, drug users, pain, sepsis, high index of suspicion. Just like recognizing that strange story in the operating room. And that you have to resuscitate them because they're in severe shock with IV fluids. And I mean more, so much fluid, in fact, that you can almost make them pop. You can get, you, they need so much fluid that they can't breathe because their belly's so tight. So much fluid that the fluid around their lungs is so great that they can't breathe anymore. Uh, and that it's got to be prompt, it's got to be aggressive, and it's got to be repeated. And then you need somebody to back you up, like our great burn surgeons we have in the burn unit. OK, here's a lady, big hernia, high, not too bad a white count. Here you can see that she's got gas on this hernia sac. She perforated her colon, a mixed necrotizing soft tissue infection. Took her to the operating room, opened her up. There you can see five days later, she's got that nice granulation tissue. Here's where her hernia lived, and we thought, what are we going to do with that? Well, we put a suction dressing on it, and eventually she did well. We uh, took us a few uh, operations, and we got her put back together. <laughs> few more examples. <laughs> Which one is this? It's a drug addict. What's the organism? Close. Somebody said strep up here. Close. Guess again. Staph, right? An abscess. We want to stay here, OK? Staphylococcus aureus. Might be MRSA. We treat them all like they might be MRSA, right? We use very aggressive antibiotic therapy up front, and we wait for our cultures to come back, because if we miss something, they're going to die. What organism is this? Our, our musician, 
strep. Group A beta hemolytic strep, a pure strep, okay? Just lifted her skin and subcutaneous tissues off of there. Another, as we call them, um, heroin enthusiast. Hard to know. Yeah, Clostridia, maybe. Um, surely it's a mixed infection, and you never know. This is a weird one. This is not an NSTI, but this is erysipelas. This is just in the skin. Treat it with antibiotics, it gets better. There's the tar built up in the subcutaneous tissue. Remember this one? Gram positive peer pressure, staph and strep. Melanie's synergistic staph strep gangrene, as is this one in the dorsum of a paraplegic foot who a week ago spilled a cup of coffee on her and didn't recognize it because she couldn't feel. There's a mixed necrotizing soft tissue infection in the buttock of somebody. Or sometimes we see white cells, and this is the ringer. Lady goes in, falls down, cuts her head, gets a tetanus shot, her arm gets bad. She comes, sends to us, we put an internal jugular line in. It gets bad. And we go, gosh, every time we touch her with something sharper than a bed sheet, she gets worse. And our chief of medicine says, you know, that sounds like pathogy or pyoderma gangrenosum. You should put her on steroids. We said, no way, we'll kill her. He says, well, it doesn't look like you surgeons are making much progress. <laughs> and lo and behold, we put her on steroids because she had a, what's known as a non-intestinal manifestation of Crohn's disease, where your immune system overreacts to a noxious stimuli, but it wasn't bacteria at all. It was all white cells, no bacteria. So I'll close with another beautiful scene. 